This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Hiroja Shai. This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Hiroja Shai. Hello, and welcome to another show. This is Hiroja Shai, your moderator of this chat, as we continue our discussion of the movies that influence uh, the television show Mr. Robot. This is a uh, Society IRC podcast, the Mr. Robot show. So this is The Matrix. It was initially intended to be and still numbered episode three. It has a bit of a subtitle, which is You Can't Like Me at My John Wick If You Don't Like Me at My Woe. And this is a review of the movie uh, The Matrix. Uh, there was an initial audio goof. And so I had to re-record this uh, episode. So, <clears throat> with this episode versus um, Back to the Future 2 and the Fight Club, uh, The Matrix is not really directly uh, spoken of within the, like either the, the show itself, like Back to the Future 2, or even discussed really heavily by anyone that's um, reviewed or talked about the show or subreddits or discussion. I mean, initially the first season, yeah, there was some discussion about uh, the Matrix, but for the most part, there's not really much discussion, and I think a lot of it has to do with a bit of the movie, its age, its influence, and really probably more to do with the trilogy as a whole than the individual movie The Matrix. But before we get into the discussion about like how the Matrix has influenced Mr. Robot and the threads that have been woven into the show, let's talk about the movie The Matrix itself. So the movie stars Warren Swishborn, uh, Keanu Reeves, uh, Carrie Ann Moss, and Hugo Weaving. It is directed by the Wakasi sisters, and it came out in 1999, a great year of movies. Another film that came out that year was Fight Club. And like Fight Club, both in a positive and negative way, The Matrix has influenced movies, particularly action films, for the next, directly for the next 10 years. But you can still see some of the elements in uh, action films now, how they're filmed, wire, CGI, and um, fight scenes um, stem from The Matrix. And mostly what it is, is like the Matrix curbed a lot of the Hong Kong, Hong Kong film styles with the particular like wire action scenes and the, the, just the action scenes themselves, how they were filmed and what was done and just made it like mainstream. So basically like that style of action film has been around for a very long time. It just didn't really hit that global or American audience or Western audience, if you will, directly. You know, John Woo has a significant influence on a lot of the action films at the time, but I think The Matrix might be, might be, might be like that peak, I guess you could say, maybe second wave of Hong Kong, Hong Kong action films, uh, or Asian films in general. I know, the John, uh, I know the genre of action films change with, what is it called, The Raid? Where you saw a more realistic fighting style. You might even say that might gone a little bit earlier with the, uh, I mispronounced it, on Boca films that came out of, uh, was it the Philippines or Korea? I forget which Asian country it came out of, but it wasn't from the Hong Kong. But the raid um, has really dramatically influenced films. You see that with the John Wick films. You see that with a lot of the action films now, where it's more realistic style. Some give credit to Jason Bourne, but Jason Bourne, it was very cut-cut, uh, phonetic, for the simple fact that even though Matt Damon may have trained a lot to do those um, action scenes and styles, uh, he's not a martial artist. Uh, Keanu Reeves, on the other hand, has you know, spent years training and uh, particularly because of The Matrix, I uh, learned Kung Fu, um, just like in the movie. And a number of the action stars are part of the raid, and the new wave of action films are, in fact, martial artists. And that's why the, the film, the fight scenes are far, far better than they have been in the past, because they have the athleticism of the actor. And I would say for the first time in maybe, at least in the Western part, 
in a, quite a good group of time, uh, I would say a decade, you actually have action stars that um, can do the action scenes but also can act, which is um, very important in this new um, modern age of uh, filmmaking, if you will. So, you know, The Matrix itself, you know, a very influential film. I remember seeing it in the movie theater. Yes, I'm kind of aging to myself here. Um, I saw it actually, I think, three times in the movie theater. Um, I saw it twice on the, the big screen. And then I saw it um, in a drive-in. So, yes, some drive-ins, you know, still do exist out there. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to have lived near some drive-ins in my time. But it's a it's an amazing film. Personally, I think it still holds up, particularly story wise. Um, effects like with the CGI, which was very revolutionary. And there's another aspect I forget to mention sometimes with um, some of the films that we were talking about: video games, um, Fight Club, uh, The Matrix have influenced the video games and video game storytelling and the action style as well. Um, it has influenced other mediums, particularly with the bullet time. If you ever played those Max Payne games or any of those, uh, I would say mid aught video games. Finally, I guess like you say, Matrix came out in 1989. And if you're unfamiliar with bullet time, it's like that slow mo bendy where you can see like the bullets passing by you or a particular um, action sequence. You know, a knife or a punch goes by you, you go slow mo, and then. The actor like bends around the action and then just starts whooping on the, the particular um, villain or whatever in, in the moment. So in the movie, the big scene is Keanu Reeves dodges bullets, and it was a very amazing um, action sequence at the time. I think it's called Bullet Time, and it was used in video games like Max Payne and, and a few other single shooter uh, action games. But, you know, it's been almost 20 years since The Matrix has come out, so the CGI is still a little wonky. You can see, kind of see where the effects and the cutouts are now. Um, Story-wise, it's still very good. The hacking parts are kind of whack. You know, you can see and read the code. But the, the social engineering aspect of the hacking that they do within the world of The Matrix um, <clears throat> is still... It's still a part. It's still, it's still something that um, hackers do, and it's still a bit realistic. So overall, the movie holds up. I totally forgot to read the synopsis of what the movie is, just in case anyone out there has never heard or seen the movie. It's basically, you know, a computer hacker learns from the mysterious rebels about the true nature of his reality and his role in the war against his controllers. Uh, basically, the film is about Reality on reality in the case of the main character played by Keanu Reeves whose name is Neo He uh, is a hacker. He realizes that there's some walkiness with the world around him, but he can't explain it He is giving an uh, God there's another influence and it's a negative one uh, Red pill blue pill, which is kind of an Alice in Wonderland thing with when you uh, Alice in Wonderland from that story if you ever seen the cartoon or the movies where she has a choice to be ta taking the one side of the mushroom, I believe it's on the caterpillar. One will make her bigger, one will make her smaller, but she doesn't know which, and she takes it. And pretty much the same thing, like, I believe the red pill opens up and allows Keanu Reeves to continue on his journey and find out what exactly it is that Lawrence Fishburne's character, a character that he's been looking for, Morpheus, is doing. Like, what is he rebelling? Why is he going after certain, I guess you could say, infrastructures within the government or whatever? And the blue pill will keep him sedated and he will continue on living his existence. Takes the red pill, and that is part of, like, this weird gamer gate alt-right and some misogyny thing that's going on, on the internet that you know these guys are awake because they've taken the red pill and it's up against SWJs and just a bunch of bullshit neo-nazi supremacists this all the negative isms you could think of wrapped in, in the concept of taking the red pill um so that 
I wouldn't say this is Matrix fault, but that, that notion, that meme, if you will, that idea is out there because of that of this film. Um, so yeah, the character Neo, he takes the red pill, he wakes up and realizes that he is not in the real world, he's in a virtual reality world, and this virtual reality world is controlled by robots who have subdued and enslaved humans and used them as uh, batteries to fill their existence. It doesn't really get into the too heavily into the mechanics of why the robots necessarily need humans for human batteries. Um, I realized that they, they talked about in the Anti-Matrix, which is an extension of the movie, or the trilogy, I should say, about the war and the nuclear power and the nukes going off and destroying the Earth, but there's all sorts of other alternative power sources that probably could have been utilized. But anyways, for the purpose of this movie, for the first one, <coughs> excuse me, the... The humans are, are batteries. They're used to fuel the existence of robots. They go about doing their business. I, you know, I always wonder what, what exactly the robots are doing. Some, you know, patrol the uh, the programs, patrol the matrix, and keep humans sedated so they can, they won't wake up and uh, stop being batteries, basically, or try to go after the robots again. But you don't need the entire robot species doing that. What, like, what were the robots doing? Were they trying to repair the earth? Were they building their own society? Like, did they play card games? Make music? I, I, I'd be really curious, and if you've watched the rest of the trilogy, uh, I guess some robots didn't quite like their existence as robots and came into the, to the Matrix and, and part of the world to exist in there because it's better than what they were doing, which I guess was, I don't know, boring or something. <laughs> But anyways, just for the first movie alone, it was just basically see the reality around you, the world that you're being projected is false, and it's a false narrative, and it's a controlling mechanism to keep you sedated, if you want to blow down the premise of the film, and then once again, a scrappy group of rebels are tearing down this controlling mechanism and the power structure behind it to free all the people. And to some extent, you could kind of see some of that influence within the uh, Mr. Robot universe with the fact that there's, once again, a scrappy group of rebels that are, in the eyes of Elliot, our main narrative, narrator, unreliable narrator, by the way, uh, character, that are trying to cont- take down the controlling mechanism of the 1%, 1% that has a hold of society and how, in this case, um, the big controlling mechanism um, that's affecting reality is money. Um, in the in the matrix, it's just basically the reality itself, the code that sedates the human existence, if you will. And the other aspect of it, which kind of gets built out more in the trilogy, but is hinted uh, heavily in the matrix, is that. Neo is the one. He's the one that is supposed to be able to unravel the code that the, the software code, if you will, that the robots have put in place as eight humans, uh, somehow unravel it and, and bring the entire system down. And it, he kind of has like kind of like a Jesus Christ kind of like a figure, which is always a, a template in a lot of these saber movies and just because of a Western culture and the heavy influence of Christianity and the book of the Bible, or particularly the New Testament, you, you always see that uh, Jesus Christ motif. Um, and so you kind of see that a tiny bit in the first season of Mr. Robot, but as you progress through season two and three, you realize, even though there's some other Christian-like um, analogies and themes within um, Mr. Robot, particularly the uh, prison scene where there's two with uh, Elliot rejecting the notion of God and how God, is, you know, just has, has rejection speech, if you will. And then you have Mr. Robot talking to Elliot in the prison and saying how Elliot was supposed to be his God and the, the Ro- Mr. Robot persona was supposed to be his prophet, the one that's supposed to spread the word of Elliot, if you will, or F society and help bring down this um, infrastructure that they all live in. But you begin to realize that this whole savior complex that Elliot has, and even to some extent Mr. Robot has, 
and we as an audience going along this journey and believing in Elliot and believing in F society is very false and unrealistic for the simple fact that, you know, Elliot is not this godlike figure. He's an extremely flawed, extremely broken person. And the manner upon which he's attempting to bring down the infrastructure, an infrastructure that has so many tentacles and everywhere and has so many means of combating any form of rebellion to the point of actually co-opting it as Mr. Phil Price broke down for both Tyler Wellick and Elliot um, as he was the Mr. Willock persona. That it's, it's a, a very difficult thing to uh, rebel against the existing reality you're living in. And I think the template, or at least the familiar template, once again, like a uh, fight club with the Tyler Durkin thing and taking the narrative of what happens after you uh, destroy the financial infrastructure. Uh, I think here, I think some of the writers um, are commenting on the fact that the whole concept of the Jesus Christ Savior figure doesn't really work. It, it doesn't work in reality. Um, but revolutions don't quite go that way. They're extremely messy and they're more than just one figure and more than just even one singular, singular cause. And that breakdown, the consequences, particularly when you see what happens to Elliot's followers with Trenton and Moby and Romero. I still hazy on Romero and what happens with Dom, even though she wasn't a follower of Elliot, uh, getting sucked up into the, to the bullshit, if you will. Um, and I, as I explained in my horror-esque uh, review of the Hitcher, and some of the, the horror elements of season three, you know, Dom's going to be a body snatcher type of a person uh, as a result of Elliot and Darlene's actions. And non-actions in some sense. But I think what um, Sam and Smell and the writers are doing here with the using of the very familiar tropes and templates of the Matrix and the revolutions to it to some extent because it's something very familiar when people think of hackers, they think of you know, the hacker movie, the Matrix, uh, I don't know, Alias. Like, it, it was some of the uh, very negative tropes, not negative tropes, but the very, like, horrible depictions of hacking that occur on television movies. Um, and also the concept of the scrappy rebels, if you will, uh, taking shot at, shot at the uh, existing infrastructure. That is not a one-shot deal. I mean, yes, to some extent, Elliot understood, even with his split personality and wrestling with himself, that there, there need to be more to be done than just simply encrypting the uh, data infrastructure of E Corp, Evil Corp, if you will. Um, that's why he had the, the, the plan to destroy the paper records, and also with Darlene, to some extent, what she was doing by using social media to some extent, but social engineering to push back against the image of evil corp with the, the center of antics of F society and going against the government, even if Elliot may not actually approved or agreed with those uh, particular actions, it, it was still kind of sort of part of the plan, if you will. It's, it's not a one-shot one, one deal. It's not like you can take a shot to end and then the virus is gone. It's a all together combined with the um, repudiation, if you will, of the fight club, the concept of taking down the financial infrastructure and there's no consequences, that being a band of scrappy rebels, you're, you're not going to go down a uh, trench and shoot a photon torpedo and bam, the Death Star is destroyed, and, you know, a la la la, you're still the heroes. I mean, granted, they did that what? Do almost three times in the Star Wars movies. You know, um, the Empire still exists and becomes the First Order. You know, morphs and stuff like that. So I guess in the Star Wars analogy, uh, they still are fighting the Empire. It's not just one one shot deal. Even though they, the Emperor is dead, and they have taken much much of the Galactic Empire down, they haven't taken the entire infrastructure down in it itself. It's a much more complex thing to be uh, rebels and even to some extent governance with the um, New Republic. 
which they kind of commented on in both Last Jedi and um, Force Awakens. But anyways, taking this notion that a lot of movies do and realizing that there is a lot more to a revolution or a rebellion, a lot more that needs to be done, and it has to be... I think the, the, the concept, I think the last two seasons that Elliot, uh, not Elliot, but um, Sam Ismail is going to, is it has to be more of a holistic approach. You can't just go, like I said, down the trench and show, shoot a photon torpedo. Or in the case of The Matrix, have this one great savior uh, solve the code and solve your problems. You, it has to be a combination of, of things and activities and people together in various ways to be able to take down the 1% of the 1%. Right now, with the current state of Mr. Robot universe, that is not the case. Pretty much, uh, on Elliot's side, everyone's either dead or defeated, and the cause is almost, in ever since the word, lost. And that's why he's back to ground zero, if you will, and repurposing himself to go again once uh, after the 1% of the 1%. But I think now maybe the lessons have been learned and he's seeking a more holistic approach and he's not the one savior. I guess you say him and his, the personality and Mr. Robot are going to work together. And you might see maybe Elliot gathering followers. I'm not sure. Who knows what's going to happen in season four. There's so many balls up in the air with uh, Brave Town Review showing up with Dom and as the inside mole with Angela, you know, nervous breakdown and air apparent to Philip Price, maybe, or to E Corp in general. Tyler Wellick is the CEO. Uh, the Washington Township plant still has to get out of town through the waterways of the United States to the Congo. You know, there's there's a lot going on, plus even the restoration of the digital records of E Corp, the global infrastructure, and as we see, the continued decaying of New York, which is going from the kind of Disneyland facade that New York has uh, at its center, if you will, to the, the kind of grimy and gritty 70s New York. Like, I guess you could say almost this is like the real face of New York as the decay is going on and the trash and the way that people behave and acting in the background and even to some extent um, within the show itself. Um, yeah, you still have to deal with that. So there's a lot going on there. And to pretty much sum it up, I, I think with this film, and its influence and how heavily it's influenced uh, the narrative story arc of, uh, once again, putting like a Jesus-like character front and center into a story, uh, the scrappy, bo scrappy band of rebels taking down, you know, the, the illusion, if you will, the controlling mechanism of society, which is an ongoing thing for a lot of these post-apoptic or um, just narrative rebellion films but it's more complex than that and we you need to evolve beyond just scrapping rebels or individuals in a one shot solution and something more complex in narrative storytelling um, more in depth if you will of seeing how a, rebel, a rebellion goes and how it can work or, or go beyond just the one shot trench approach into a more like all the different elements of story narrative telling you can tell about a full blown rebellion and all its complexity, um, ongoing complexities that you can draw from either history, time, or just from your imagination, if you will. So that's it. Um, I would highly recommend watching The Matrix again and just looking at it from years gone by if you haven't seen it in a while and just looking at the story and seeing how well narratively it does hold up um, and thematically it has some shortcomings if you will and storytelling and narrative speaking has evolved over um, time in the last almost 20 years and it's thanks to the Matrix at least getting a shot in the arm of different genres and stuff like that but uh, I think 
we are now in the age of where there's a significant amount of maturity in storytelling and different ways of telling stories and going more in depth and allowing for growth uh, within the story, uh, particularly with these shorter seasons, uh, at least as far as uh, American television goes, allowing for more time per episode, but shorter seasons overall where you're not doing a lot of padding or filling episodes and you're able to tell a very consistent and cohesive story arcs or story narratives and plot out things into a, um, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Much similar to, like, I guess you could say a book or even a video game to some extent. So that's it. Um, I thank you all very much for listening. Um, you can help support, you know, F Society RC podcast by either going on to our website and donating there through PayPal. As always, um, there's links in the show notes to where you can purchase um, the various seasons of um, Mr. Robot through Amazon links. And you can also purchase this movie and the other movies that have been discussed in the seven-part series about the, the narrative influences on the Mr. Robot story uh, through the Amazon links. And if you're really, really, really into it, you can also uh, give... Um, whatever favorite flavor choice of cryptocurrency you like. Uh, This is Herosia Shai, your moderator, logging off now. And until next time. This has been a Herosia Shai Space Odyssey Network production.